All right, good morning for those in the United States and good afternoon for those elsewhere. I'd like to welcome everyone to the first webinar of the, well, second now of the WCRP Digital Earth Lighthouse Activity Webinar Series. My name is Kelly Nunez Ocasio from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and I'll be one of the moderators of today's event. The webinar series is part of the WCRP Digital Earth Lighthouse Activity. The aim of this series is to help maintain more regular and open dialogue between researchers and users on the development and evaluation of kilometer scale global and large domain models across the world. We plan to hold seminars every two months spawning a range of groups working on kilometer scale modeling around the world. You can find a recording of the first event held in September via the webinar webpage linked on this slide. The focus for today is on simulating the Earth system at kilometer scale and learning from the experiences of colleagues at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And now I will pass on to our other moderator today, Hugh Lewis. Hi, everybody, and a very warm welcome um, from my side. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you're joining us from. And hello to everyone who's watching this uh, recording back uh, whenever you find it. So my name is Hugh Lewis, and I'm from the Met Office in the UK. And before we introduce our speakers, just to provide an overview of some of the um, logistics and modes of interaction around um, today's event. So uh, we're delighted to welcome three speakers uh, to talk us through their work today. And while they're talking, please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A panel um, in, your, uh, in your Zoom setup at the bottom of this window. Uh, you can also use the, the up voting thumbs up um, for any particular questions that you want to ensure that we cover in the time available to work through the Q&A uh, at the end of this session. Um, please reserve the chat function for any uh, kind of technical issues you may have. So um, start adding your questions as soon as you wish to in, in the Q&A box, please. Um, and in particular, this is aiming to be a really open um, opportunity to interact with the speakers. So please don't be afraid to add your questions. Um, for the speakers, we will uh, aim to keep you to time and. Uh, and ensure there's time at the end for, for, for us to cover those. So now it's a real pleasure and, and a, a big thank you to, to, uh, to welcome today's speakers. Um, so Dr. Daniel Clocker uh, is group leader of the Computational Infrastructure and Model Development Group at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Germany, uh, with a main focus on building an exascale-ready global kilometer scale Earth system model. He completed his PhD at MPI on uncertainty in um, general circulation model-based climate sensitivity estimates uh, before taking on roles at ECMWF, Deutsche Wetterdienst, working on high-resolution ICON uh, and convection processes. And Daniel's also co-lead of the gas project within GWEX and co-lead of the Diamond Winter Experiment. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Niels Brueggemann. Is, he is the group leader at NPI in Complex Modeling and Extreme Computing Group responsible for ICON ocean development. Niels completed his PhD at the University of Hamburg on ageostrophic ocean processes before taking on roles at Tudor and later Hamburg and MPI. And finally to introduce you all to uh, Dr. Hans Segura, who's a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology, uh, working with kilometer scale earth system models to explore the role of surface conditions on tropical rainfall at these scales. And Hans completed his PhD from the University of Grenoble uh, and arrived at MPI in 2021 following a period of research at the Geophysics Institute of Peru. So a big thank you to the three of you for presenting your work uh, and sharing your experiences with us today and really looking forward to your presentation on learning from simulating the Earth system at kilometre scale. And so with that, um, Daniel, the floor is yours, yours to kick off and thank you again. Thank you very much for the introduction and <clears throat> for the possibility for us to speak and then present the work we are doing at MPI. Um, hang on, do you see my slides? Yes, uh, yes we do, okay. they're in full yeah. screen. Thanks. I see some. Okay, thanks. Um, and um, <clears throat> so I'm 
At the Max Planck Institute for Metrology, we are interested in understanding our changing climate. And one of the tools we use for that are kilometer scale, um, the so kilometer scale Earth system model. And I'm presenting here on behalf of really many colleagues at MPI, but also at partner institutions who developed this model with us. Um, <clears throat> we have split this or decided to split this presentation to the, so that you have the experts for different parts of the modeling system um, to, to question and that the ex experts can present um, their parts. Um, but also to really give you an earth system view of what we do, because that's at the center of our modeling strategy that we try to attack the earth system at kilometer scale and not a single component. And then, so I will talk mainly about the more technical aspects of our modeling approach and uh, Niels and Hans will focus on uh, separate components and their interactions with other components. So <clears throat> um, why do we want to si simulate the earth system at kilometer scale? So um, for us, it's important, it's at higher resolution, you resolve more physics. So, and you resolve the dominant mode of energy transport in the tropics, um, um, which uh, you will resolve eddies in the ocean, ice leads using laws of physics and um, more realistic or high resolution lower boundary conditions like um, the symmetry and topography and uh, in the land cover. The hope is that this improves the large scale circulation, that you get process level RC interactions representation of extremes or better representation of extremes in some cases I would even claim the first time the representation of some of the extremes. Um, you get information at scales relevant for the impact on people's life, like catchment scales, and um, also on scales we observe. The Earth. So we don't need to do any statistical uh, analysis to directly link to observations. <clears throat> um, also, very importantly, we get scale interactions from local to global scales and back, also a very important. And also what is very um, important for us is uh, we get in essentially simpler models. We have less equations, less lines of codes, at least from of the scientific codes, which means also less bugs, less assumptions, and essentially simpler models and making them much easier to understand. Of course, this part is simpler, but there's a technical aspects in terms of using high, um, high performance computing. These aspects get more complicated. And also don't underestimate um, inspiration and uh, in communication, how these beautiful pictures you can generate with these kilometer scale models. At least for me personally, I draw a lot of inspiration and motivation from these simulations for my work. And what can they be useful for these models? So studies of convergence start to make sense. I mean, if you have a consistent modeling setup across resolutions, uh, we can answer questions if we get consistent responses uh, to perturbation, at least in sign on climate regime scale. That's a hope, so I mean, it's all questions we want to address. Um, in terms of ensembles, do we really sample uncertainty right with existing um, ensembles we have, um, which are mostly structurally similar models? So we would add another structurally different model to the existing ensembles. So if it behaves the same, it's very interesting. If it behaves differently, also interesting. So, so do we get any out of sample trajectories? Questions like, are current models overfitted and react too stable to perturbations? We can address and really fundamental questions. So will the rainforest collapse? Will we see major circulation shifts? Is the ITCZ structure stable? How will the monsoon margins change? All very hard to answer with the current models we use. <clears throat> But they're very important. And again, the fascination of our planet. We can visualize phenomena. We see the planet, how we experience it. And this is um, very important for our motivation, but also in the communication with people who don't have such deep insights. <clears throat> so hang on, I have to move you because I have myself in front of the slides. So now I'll go back. Um, so, and in, in terms here um, on this slide, I show um, CMIP5 and CMIP6 models and how their resolution in the atmosphere and in, in the ocean was. So you see in the atmosphere resolution was around, I don't know, 160, 180 kilometers. And on average, this big cross in 2013 for CMIP5 models and its uh, resolution increased to, to about 120 kilometers or so on average for, um, for CMIP6 models. And um, the first um, round of um, 
um, models which entered the first assessment report of IPCC, they had about around 500 kilometer resolution. So resolution increased, but not a lot. And at the meantime, um, the power of uh, computing power of um, computers increased a lot. So the top 500 list, which is often taken as a reference for the speed of computers only started in 1993. And the first assessment report from IPCC was published in 99. So it doesn't go back as far, but the fastest machine at that time was the one teraflop machine. Um, so a floating point operations. And now we, we entered the extra scale era last year. Of, of computers. So that's a factor million. And in compute power, which is available, not all to us, but in general, if we take this as the measure of what also is available to us, that's about a factor million. And the question is, where, where did it go? Because if you take 500 kilometer resolution and you would always take a factor eight for halving the resolution, we would be able about to run like a two kilometer model um, taking the factor million of computations into account. So in refinement in the X and Y direction and um, the time steps. Um, but of course, there are other things where you can uh, invest um, compute power in. So CMIP model refined resolutions slowly, but they did. Um, complexity, scenarios, ensemble size, simulation things, all these aspects were prioritized and also for, for very good reasons. <clears throat> but at the same time, Climate modeling really ceased being a frontier application for new compute technologies, because um, at the time in the in the nineties, um, climate models were really the frontier applications for the newest and biggest machines, which is not the case anymore. So, our strategy is now to we want to profit from this factor million in, in increased compute power. Um, and um, how we, we show this here on the y-axis here of the ensemble members, which can run at one simulated years per day, so the throughput. Um, that's kind of a measure when um, models become useful for climate um, applications uh, or questions. Um, and everything below that uh, we, we consider as like models which are used for process studies or very specific um, questions. And, that, uh, and then on the y-axis, we have the horizontal resolution which goes from this 500 kilometers, which was used in the 90s, um, to, to one kilometer. So it represents kind of physics. So how much of the physics do we resolve and what needs to be parameterized? And then we have something called the computational frontier. So what can we actually do? Everything to the right top of that, that it's not achievable to us. So we, we, we cannot compute there. But um, to the left of, of this line, uh, we can compute. And um, CMIP, I, I put here the black dots from the previous CMIP um, um, is, is, is roughly there. So in this 130, 120 kilometer range in resolution, and we can run many ensemble members. The green dot is the, the average resolution of the high resolution, um, high risk MIP, um, models. <clears throat> But uh, and there's uh, the limit of strong scaling. So that means uh, um, um, so when you increase compute power, and, uh, but, but leaves the problem you want to solve or the number of computations um, the same, and you, you cannot increase on that for, for a certain model. So that's a hard, um, strong scaling limit. And <clears throat> if you want to move, if you have a, a model which is structured for, for certain computations, if you want to move to higher resolutions, it's, it's really hard to move along the line of the strong scaling limit. So our approach is that we build a new model where, where we start off at the computational frontier or as close as possible at we, as we can get and also um, <clears throat> get a throughput which um, is applicable to um, for, for climate simulation. <clears throat> and then it is much easier to, to move to the left on this plot. So if we have this model and we want to um, run it at coarser resolution with higher throughput, that is very easily achievable. So we try to solve the, the hard problems first and then make our lives easier in the, um, afterwards. So um, that's where we are roughly now. So that's the biggest computer we have our access to in, in the moment, which is uh, Lumi or the biggest computer in uh, Europe. It's a big GPU machine using AMD GPUs. And uh, we run our model 
on, on large parts of this machine. And here's for the 10 kilometer, five, 2.5 and one kilometer. So we see the model gets faster with more nodes. <clears throat> and um, it's early days that we are, well, are running on this machine. So we still expect a speed up um, or, um, of our model, um, a significant speed up. So it's not the end of the days. And we know, um, know where our limitations are currently. But it works and we get already, we can run at least a five kilometer model, we can already run a lot faster than at a simulated yield per day. So, and also using these new technologies also says we are more energy efficient. For example, if we run Icon on GPUs for the same simulation, we do use between five and 10 times less energy, for example. So this is an important aspect. So <clears throat> now coming more to the science part of that. So I said, um, um, uh, studies of convergence start to make sense. So we did this here with the aqua plant configuration where we refined consecutively the resolution from 160 kilometers to uh, one, one kilometer. And here, this is uh, shown the zonal mean of precipitation after long integrations. And we see the ITZZ, what we expect, it switches at some point from a single to a double ITZZ. If that is right or not, we don't know, it's an aqua planet. But uh, we are interested in where does the model converge to. And the position of the ITZ kind of converges, which is symbolized with the crosses. And on the bottom is we also see the width of the ITZ, which also converges towards one kilometer. But this is, what is more surprising that the, the, the storm tracks, which we expect coarser resolution models to do quite well, keep shifting also forward with resolution. So there's a systematic forward shift of the storm tracks with higher resolution, which was a surprise for us. And I think it's also a surprise um, from what we expect from our models and also the literature. So these are new questions which um, which which come up. Why is that if we represent the small scale processes that our storm tracks start to shift? Start to shift. Um, so and I stressed before that uh, for us it's really important to keep an earth system um, approach. So we have to uh, carry all the complexity of the earth system model to the kilometer scale. So. Here it's just a schematic showing ICON and its component with atmosphere, ocean, and land, uh, which are coupled. We have an in computational infrastructure, but we have also component for the biogeochemistry of the land uh, and the ocean. We can couple um, interactive aerosols. Now we'll just show you some some glimpses of that. Um, um, so um, to show that we follow this route. So here we did a five kilo coupled simulation. The simulation was for one year. Coupled atmosphere, ocean, land is there, of course, with sea ice, but we coupled with the ocean biogeochemistry, which has an additional uh, 20 traces, I think. And here we see the CO2 flux and the uptake in blue and the outgassing in, in red from the ocean. <clears throat> and, um, and it's really interesting to see here, I mean, we see in these gray, um, pinkish shades, the wind speed. So here we see, uh, we see a storm. Uh, for example, and later we will also zoom into a hurricane, the interaction on these small scales between the wind systems or the convective systems, the storm systems uh, with the ocean, the ocean currents, and what this means for the CO2 flux. Here, for, for example, now there should be a hurricane. Yeah, here's a hurricane forming in the Atlantic, moving <clears throat> to the north, and we, we see uh, like a strong outgassing in the front of the hurricane, and then the, this bluish kind of track saying that the um, CO2 uptake of the ocean is larger in the wake of the hurricane. Uh, and another um, aspect of complexity is interactive aerosols. Here um, shown, this is uh, work done within the NextGems project um, with from by colleagues in at the University of Oxford. They implemented a, um, an aerosol um, scheme in which also takes care of um, aerosol cloud interaction into ICON. And here you see a global map from a five kilometer simulation again for um, um, uh, dust, sea salt in blue, black carbon in greenish colors and uh, sulfate in these um, uh, yellow colors. And zooming in here again, the tropical Atlantic, you see the interaction, for example, a little sea salt where you have little wind and then close to the convective clouds. If you focus a little bit on the Western Atlantic, you see that where you have strong precipitation, but you also get a washout from mm. these, um, these aerosols. So, and another aspect I want to, to touch on 
high resolution models are also always associated with enormous data amounts. And um, we also spent quite some effort on making the, the waterfall of data somehow um, digestible or easy to handle. Um, <clears throat> So the point is a little bit good data or climate model data is usually written once, but read very often. So we try to structure our data in a way that it's 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 uh, structured for reading because this is done very often and it shouldn't be a very tedious task. <clears throat> um, our approach currently is so we have rethought how we, we handle data sets and use for us, at least, no new approaches for our community, but these are tools which exist since a while to enable HR uh, analysis of massive and diverse data sets. So we, we use our coupler, which is coupled, which, where we, which we also use to couple components between, for example, ocean atmosphere in our model to, to write to a standardized grid. We chose the Helpix grid, which has very nice properties, which allows one of the properties that it's hierarchical. And we store the data in in chunks, so we <clears throat> and access it via catalogs. And this helps us um, to speed up analysis time for the scientists by orders of magnitude in time. So, um, and a big part of it is really this hierarchical organization of the data. I mean, um, Hilpix stands for hierarchical equal area isolatitude or pixelation of the sphere, and um, and this allows the hierarchical um, um, ordering of the data and also the access depending on what kind of analysis what you want. So the worst case, we are as slow as we ever were, but in 99% of a typical analysis scientists would do with the data, we are several orders of magnitude faster than analysis and um, um, analyzing the data. So you can really intuitively play with the simulations and the data. So I stop here and I will pass on straight to my colleague Hans Segura and please keep your questions. No, sorry, not Hans, Niels, Niels Brugemann, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Boris, uh, thank you, Daniel, and also hello from my side. So let me share my screen. As Daniel said already, so a lot of these kilometer scale modeling is also about beautiful structures and here I brought you some creatures from the ocean. So uh, what you see here is vorticity, but that's not the main purpose of uh, what I want to show. I just want to show how rich, uh, how rich actually the structure of these mesoscale and submesoscale phenomena can be. And um, yeah, how fun it can be to look uh, at all these, these structures. And um, this guy here, actually, this is um, an Angula's ring and um, this is uh, one person that we will meet or, or one, one creature that we will meet on the second next slide. But before I come to this creature again, so um, I want to talk a bit briefly about this, uh, one of the two simulations that I want to introduce to you today. So the first one is this Apollo simulation. And um, of course, yeah, we, we are not so exciting as these astronauts here, uh, and we didn't dare to climb in a rocket, but uh, yeah, we just, we rather used the computer, so a bit more conservative approach. And uh, with this computer, we set up a model that runs at uh, that a horizontal resolution of roughly 1.25 kilometers. And um, so we have this coupled actually in the ocean and in the atmosphere. With the ocean, we run a short spin up of three months, but then we couple it for one week and um, and the next on the next slides I will show you a couple of impressions of this simulation. So here's our creature again. So an Angula's ring. To the right, to the right hand side, you see the coast of Africa. And uh, so a lot of things that we that we learn about these um, or learn from these kilometer scale models are actually new questions. So and. One question is about eddy dissipation. So um, you might have heard that, that eddy dissipation is, is one conundrum in the ocean circulation. So of course, it's, if eddies are in, in geostrophic balance, and it's not so clear how they actually can dissipate their energy because there are certain constraints which rather make the energy trans, uh, to be transferred to larger scales. But of course, it's somehow the energy needs to be dissipated. And 
One prominent candidate for this dissipation is uh, Lee wave generation. And in fact, what you can see here now on the lower panel, you can see actually that, that there are a couple of waves going off the center of this eddy. When this eddy is crossing the Wolfus bridge, which it does here in this in this uh, figure. So um, one question that we try to answer now with these type of kilometer scale model is how much energy actually do mesoscale eddies lose to Lee wave emission, but also to other eddy dissipation processes. So another interesting aspect is um, sea ice actually. So uh, as Daniel has mentioned, so we also have sea ice coupled to our ocean model. And once you approach um, kilometer scale resolution, you see completely new structures in the sea ice. For instance, you see when you zoom in, you see leads and cracks in the ice, which you couldn't see in, in coarser simulations. And these cracks and, and, um, and leads, they are created actually by winds, tides, and eddies. And uh, they are subject or they, they feature actually strong heat loss of the ocean. And the question is now, how important is this actually? Is this a major heat, uh, is this a major player actually in, in, for the Arctic and, and Antarctic heat budgets? Is this important for deep water formation? And that is something that, that we also try to answer. Um, but this 1.25 kilometer actually that was not enough for all our purposes and questions. So let me now introduce to you a second type of simulation where we kind of uh, try to develop a telescope, uh, a telescope that allows us to that allows us to resolve submesoscale dynamics. And we again don't have this nice telescope as Galileo had at, at his time. We have just a um, telescope that, that rather looks like this. So here you can see. Uh, the horizontal resolution of our, of our what we call this telescope or submesoscale telescope simulation, and we in this type of simulation we make use actually that icon operates on a triangular grid and that we can refine the grid resolution. So here you see a very high resolution in the North Atlantic, and uh, a resolution actually actually up to five hundred thirty meters, and then the resolution decreases gradually outwards. And so here, wherever we have the focus area, we can then now study the ocean with relatively or with actually with very high resolution and, and investigate um, yeah, interactions um, between processes within these areas. So, but we can, we not only have one of these configurations, but we can actually like a carpet over a ball, we can, we can shift this focus region. And we also set up a second simulation where the focus is now in the South Atlantic. And here actually where you see the black triangle, there was also a research mission, a uh, cruise, um, research cruise took place there. And uh, we will see in the end some, some data comparison between our model and, um, and, uh, and um, these, uh, some observations which were taken there. So with this type of, of simulation, we actually, are able to achieve even higher resolutions, although this is a rather regional approach compared to the global approach that you have seen before. So, but let me show you a bit how the situation looks like. Here you see uh, what I call the local Rossby number. So the relative vorticity divided by the planetary vorticity. You see the simulation where the grid is refined in the South Atlantic, and you see a couple of Agulhas rings coming around the corner here and propagating into the interior of the Atlantic. And uh, what you can see is that at the rim of these eddies, but also somewhere uh, north of these eddies, you see all these sub scale structures. Also here along the coast, you see actually, sorry, you see actually the sub scale structures emerging. And um, yeah, and it's actually quite fascinating to, to look at these, at these structures. But also fascinating actually to to see what these what these what these models or what what these eddies are doing. So and one thing that we want to do is we want to learn actually about um, about typical polarizations that are applied in coarser models. We want to learn how they are justified and how yeah or how our our fine resolution model can actually. Um, yeah, capture these processes, and then how can how does it compare to these parameterizations? So, 
Here, this is from the submesoscale telescope in the North Atlantic, and um, there are several fronts um, depicted here. PhD student of mine, Moritz Epke, did this work, and he picked out um, these fronts in the North Atlantic, and in particular, this front that you can see on the right hand side. Um, he looked at the overturning. So as you might know that um, these, these mesoscale fronts, they are often subject to dark clinic instability. And then you have sub mesoscale eddies in the mixed layer, which overturn these fronts. And that is what he actually observed here. So it looks like a textbook example, but here in a relatively realistic simulation with realistic forcing and symmetry and so on and so forth. And he, investigated or he diagnosed the strengths of this overturning for all these fronts and he is comparing this with typical parameterizations, what you can see here on the lower left. And now the question is how actually how well can these parameterizations capture these these submesoscale overturning? And it turns out that um they're actually not too bad, although there's room for improvement. There's room for improvement. So but these type of questions are I think they are interesting that we have now a good laboratory for actually, or new laboratory even for, for evaluate parameterizations. Often that was done before with idealized configurations, but here in this more realistic setup, it is um, a bit more advanced because you have typically more processes compared to this idealized setups. And um, yeah, but you're also a bit more on, yeah, a bit more on the, on the safe side that, that you actually have all processes or at least most of the processes which might be relevant for this um, for this dynamics. So another question is actually, and here comes the cruise data into play. So it's actually how what what does these um, what does the eddies and the submesoscale scale structures how do they interact with internal waves and particularly internal waves generated by tides? And um, Moritz Epke did here um, an analysis where he actually looked um, into a section or a corridor of this Angulas rings. And uh, we have also the, the mooring data of this research cruises that I mentioned. And he is now comparing this, uh, the, the energy spectra from this, from this uh, two mooring data sets with the, um, with the kinetic energy spectra from the model. And what you see here is that uh, you have a typical frequency um, energy spectrum. You see the low frequencies, so the the low time scales on the on the left hand side, and the, um, so the long time scales on the left hand side and the short time scales on the right hand side. You see a couple of peaks where, for instance, the inertial period is, but also where the tides have their peaks, and you see three different curves. So the blue curve actually is our default model configuration, and the red one is the mooring data, and as you can see they compare relatively nicely, at least over a large range of frequencies. But if we would not have the tides, and that is what the orange curve is showing, so this is a sensitivity simulation without tides, you can see that actually we are missing most of the energy at the high frequency range. So actually with including the tides, we made this model much more realistic in terms of, of low frequent energetics. And now a question that I, another PhD candidate is, is going after is how much do mesoscale eddies modify this tidal energy dissipation? So with this, I like to thank you. And uh, I hand over directly to Hans, who will tell you a bit more about the atmosphere. Yes, uh, back. Thank you, and do you see my, my slide? Yes. yes, cool. Thank you, Nils. Um, okay, uh, my name is Hans, Hans Segura, and I will complement what already have said by Nils and Daniels in the last presentations. But my topic is more, as Nils said, atmosphere and atmosphere ocean, atmosphere land also. Uh, I will talk about the what we learn about tropical precipitation when doing this uh, kilometer scale air model system. And for the tropical precipitation, I will focus mostly on the tropical rain belt, which is a narrow band of precipitation circumventing the equator, which plays an important role in the energy and water cycle. 
So um, from the tropical rainbed, I will focus most on the um, structure of the tropical rainbed. So what we did is in our first version of the simulations, we integrate uh, this uh, simulation for one year. And then we calculate the annual mean of precipitation and then the quantality of this annual mean. And this is what you observe in the blue region here. So the area inside the blue region is the, where the regions where it rains more than quantality, and that's what I call the tropical rain bed. We did the same analysis with the uh, observational part. So we took 20 years of high merge. Um, we do the annual mean of the climatology, calculate the quantity, and then you observe here the blood contour. And when we compare this to simulation and observation, we figure out that there is quite a very nice match over the land and some particular in oceans, like uh, in the Eastern Pacific and the Atlantic. But yes, we see a uh, very um, weird behavior in the Indo-Pacific region. We observe a double structure of precipitation, which is related to the double ITCC. So we say, okay, we didn't figure out, didn't fix the double ITCC by going to five kilometer resolution. But then say, okay, this relationship that we observe of the annual structure of precipitation, in particular over land, holds also if we go to the seasonal cycle. And this is very important because uh, already uh, classical models using convective parametrization are not good into simulating this seasonal cycle of the tropical rain belt. So we say, okay, let's do this step. So what we did is to track the tropical rain belt in different regions in the tropics, uh, over ocean and over land. And here is an example for South America. And the marker here indicates the position of the central of the tropical rain belt. And the colors here indicate how this tropical rain belt moves across the year for every month, from January in February in blue to November, December in red. We also calculate the area inside the tropical rain belt in South America. And this is indicated by the size of the marker. So small markers, small areas, big markers, big, big areas. So when we compare the simulation, which is here in cycle with solid lines, with the observational part, which is in a square with dashed lines, we realize that there is a mostly a perfect match in what we observe between the simulation um, the observational part over the land. In particular, we can observe how it goes, uh, the tropical rain belt towards the south during the summer season, which is the monsoon season in South America, and also how it increases in size. So that's why you have big markers there. But when we were, we did this analysis to the ocean, we didn't get the same results. We observed that the model is kind of way off of what the, the observational part is telling us in terms of the position of the tropical rain belt and the meridional and zonal migration. And this result is telling us that when we start to resolve convective storms, we are able to capture the coupling that exists between the land and the atmosphere. And it seems that this coupling is robust against what's happening over the ocean. This is a nice hypothesis. And but how we can prove this? And one way to prove this is to use other version of the, of the model of the simulations in order to see if, yes, there is a big change compared to the, what we observe in our first version of the simulation or not. So we did these new versions because we want to improve the things what we observe over the ocean. Like uh, we modify the true glass scheme, we modify the radiation, and also we adapt a new ocean module. And so what happened there? And this is the result. So here, what you are observing here is the annual mean of the precipitation of this new simulation for five years. And again, here is the structure of the tropical rain belt, which is the quantity of this annual mean of uh, five years of simulation. And what is very interesting is the land seems not to change too much in terms of the area and the location, but what it really can surprise us is the way that the ocean change a lot. So instead of having a double band of precipitation, as you observe here in the Indo-Pacific, we get or we got one single band, which is good because it's kind of similar to what observation is telling us. But at the same time, it's telling 
us that the ocean is very sensitive to the model's uh, configuration. Um, so we say, okay, this is the annual cycle. Let's go to the seasonal cycle to see if also that handles. And then, okay, this is the result. We apply the same technique. But in this case, we have the solid and the cycle is the old version of the simulation, while the square and the dashed line is the new version of the simulation. Again, is five years of integration of the model. And we observe that over the land, comparing these two simulations or new uh, with different uh, configuration, it's quite similar. So there are little difference there. But again, it's quite of the structure and the migration is quite quite similar. But if we go to the ocean, we see a different picture. The tropical rainbow of the seasonality of the tropical rainbow have different characteristics. It's closing to the what is real, but it's not still what we observe with the satellite data. And this again, this result is telling us that the terrestrial rainbow is robust against what the configurations we are using to the simulation, and that goes to the point that, and that's going to the point that um, by resolving convective storms, we can get this coupling that exists between the land and the atmosphere. But over the ocean, it's more complicated. We cannot get this structure. And we were thinking about that, and we come up with, there are different hypotheses for that. One is the microphysics. One can be also the turbulence scheme. And the third player there is the RC coupling. And understanding the RC coupling by itself is very complicated. And I will tell you why it's so challenging. So, so here I am showing you uh, three variables that are very important for the momentum budget in the upper part of the ocean in this RC interface, which are the winds, the ocean currents, and the mixing layer there. We know that the winds are the most important source of momentum that can accelerate the ocean currents, but at the same time can deepen the mixing layer there. So we took these three variables of, the, of our simulation for one region in the tropical Atlantic, and we obtained this figure. So what we you observe here in the way axis is the ocean current velocity, and the X axis is the wind stress. And the color bar is the mixing layer there. And what we observe that with very strong wind forcing, instead of having a one-to-one -one relationship between the wind stress and the ocean velocity, we are getting a very deep, shallow mixing layer there. But if we go to medium or very uh, weak uh, wind forcing, we can accelerate the wind. And in order to, es to explain this characteristic, we need to introduce one player for this game, which is the stratification. So what the stratification is doing is to prevent the mixing and making child of the mixing layer there. And at the same time, uh, converging all the momentum or keeping all the momentum in this very shallow mixing layer depth and giving the possibility to accelerate the ocean currents in the upper part of the ocean. And in the tropics, one way to stratify the ocean aside of the temperature is precipitation because precipitation with its low density because of the low salinity can sharpen the profile of density in the upper part of the ocean and again, make hard for the mixing. So if this is the case in our simulations, we wanted to know how much should precipitate in order to stratify the upper part of the ocean. So this question allowed me to work with very talented uh, early career scientists here from the Institute. And what we did is to go to the tropical Atlantic, track many different uh, precipitation events and classify, classify them in terms of the intensity in the way axis here and the duration of these events in the X axis. And then for these events, precipitation events, we compute the difference that exists of the mixing layer depth during the precipitation event compared to before the precipitation event. And this is the color bar that you observe here. So blue means that there is a shallow wind of the mixing layer depth when it's precipitating. And what we, we obtain is that, yes, we can uh, shallow the mixing layer depths due to precipitation, 
it seems to be a threshold for this relationship. Uh, and it seems the threshold seems to be more than 10 or 20 millimeters per day. And moreover, we observe that during these precipitation events, we observe signals of current acceleration. And this result is very interesting because again, it's telling us that the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean is, is complicated to understand, it's very tricky. But also for the second part, uh, there are already observational studies telling us that indeed there is rain layers in the in the ocean that can accelerate the ocean currents due to the wind forcing and due to the, the stratification of the upper part of the ocean, which is telling us that, oh, the simulations and can again capture this kind of relationship. Okay, and this result allows us to uh, go to my one of my final slides, which is what I learned from these simulations. So what we learned in by analyzing these outputs is that the coupling that exists between the land and the atmosphere is different than the coupling that exists between the ocean and the atmosphere. And this is revealed when we start to resolve convective storm and ocean eddies. And this statement pop up or raises two questions. One is why or what is the mechanism from the land to make it robust for the model uh, difference in the configuration of the model and also in reality, because we also analyzed this in the observational part and we found that the structure of the tropical rainbow over the land in observation is quite, have little variability on the internal and time scale. And the second point is how and where the RC coupling can affect the structure of the precipitation. Okay, these are two questions that are very important. And um, I want to finish my presentation showing the summarize of our talk of the three of us from Daniels, Nils, and me. And we believe that may not be, uh, no, us only, but the Institute and with the people involved in the development of kilometer scale air system model, that this is a crucial milestone because of three things. The first one is that we can use now efficiently the resources from the new technology that we have in our hands, not only to build the model, not only to run the model, but also how to store the data, how to handle the data, and also the new tools that we need to uh, create or originate in order to analyze this amount of data. The second point is that uh, by using these air system models at kilometer scale, we are using less parametrizations. And at some point is given to our models more physics. And this is this is half a, a good point, an advantage in representing a small structure, uh, as has been shown by Niels regarding the eddies. And now we can answer what is the importance of the end for the en energy value between the atmosphere and the ocean. And also this is shown by Daniels that in order to have a stable stored tram, a stored track, we need to go to five or 2.5 kilometer in the grid spacing, horizontal grid spacing. And by resolving this small structure of our climate, we figure out or we think or we believe that this will lead us to a better representation of our climate feature. And with that, I, need, I want to thank to, to, to the organizers for this, uh, for, for giving us the opportunity to show your works. Um, finally, I want to say that yeah, just a little advertisement. We, we colleagues here in the Institute with the European Center of Weather Forecast and also uh, colleagues from Tokyo, the University of Tokyo, we have a session where we want to gather all the people working on kilometer scale models on the global scale to know what is the climate feature that all of us, of all these models can reproduce, and also what are the challenges. To un and these challenges means to understand the bias that we need to tackle in the future years. And with that, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Um to Daniel, to Niels, uh, and to Hans. Uh, a wonderful presentation showing uh, fantastic progress and um, some, as you described them, very inspirational um, impressions of the Earth system uh, at these resolutions for us to, to jump into.
Um, if you have questions for any of our speakers, please use the Q and A um, panel at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen uh, to add your question. And then we've got some time now for uh, Kelly and I to, to work through those questions. A reminder as well, if you want us to get to some of the questions sooner than others, please use the uptick um, icon uh, on the Q&A panel and we'll try and try and get to them. Um, so with that, um, Kelly, if you're happy to kick off. Thank you. The first question comes from Sebastian. Can you give an example reference for an improved large scale circulation in CRDCM as stated in slide two? I guess that's for me. Of course, my slide too. <laughs> um, so I, yes, so I formulated with hope, but of course we have also many places where where this is true. But uh, actually, there was large hope attached to that we get rid of the ITZ, double ITZ bias, and Hans showed at least currently that's not the case. But he also showed examples where this is the case. So so there's one. Um, of the seasonal migration of the um, precipitation over land is one example. Another example, maybe making advertisements for the presentation and for the next seminar, which is giving, given by Daiske Tadaska, uh, and uh, he shows how the Madden Julian estimation um, is simulated really well and how you can get handles on how this uh, is uh, simulated very well in these uh, storm resolver models. That's another example. So. Probably Daisuke will tell you a lot about it in two months. Then from my personal, uh, what I did, the, the inner tropical circulations regarding to the doldrums, how the inner structure of the IGZZ, we, we know that <clears throat> that these circulations are uh, a lot better. Um, so I think there are, there are a lot of, of examples. So it's... Um, um, it's a disappointing question, or I mean, it's an interesting question. Why didn't we progress as much on the um, the structure of the double ITZZ, or how did, why we didn't get rid of that yet? Uh, or what are the other aspects which play an important role there, if it's a coupling to the ocean, or is it related to the microphysics or the turbulence? Um, but now we have a framework where we can actually tackle these questions um, rather than... Um, um, trying to work on assumptions in our parameterization. So um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. OK, and another question on the, the theme of evaluation against observations, uh, I think to you, Niels, on uh, your wild creatures of the ocean. So Jan Peter Schultz asks, are the eddies in the ocean realistic? And what about your comparisons to observations? Yeah, that's. Um... Tricky question, what, what does realistic mean in the sense and how can we judge that? So there are observations um, of ocean eddies, of course, from satellites um, most of the time. And the satellite observations, uh, they of course show the mesoscale eddies. So these eddies, which are roughly 50 to 100 kilometers big. And I think that that we are quite confident that, that we get these eddies relatively correct in our models. So these Agulas rings, for instance, that I've shown, they are there um, in reality as well. And um, and also the frequency that our model produces them is kind of okay. Um, so, but of course we cannot, this is not a synoptic model. So we cannot really forecast every um, single eddy occurrence uh, at the accurate time so that is um, therefore we are more accurate on a statistical level but not on a synoptic um, case study level and in terms of the smaller scale structures these sub scale eddies there are also observations available from from some from moving data some most of them actually from glider data which show that these sub scale um, dynamics exist and um yeah, and so and there are some properties, as I've mentioned, for instance, this overturning of these mesoscale eddies, which are developed from theory, which were then um, applied or or simulated with idealized models, and we find them here as well. So we are relatively confident that these are also um, at least that the that the that these phenomena are not made up by our model. How in terms of of um, quantity, uh, in terms of the yeah how 
uh, how good we are in this respect actually this remains to be shown i would say so there is a new satellite mission the SWAT satellite mission you might have heard about and so um, we are keen of course to evaluate our model with this data so we have used current satellite observations to evaluate fluctuations and there our model was okay but this kind of ends at uh, fluctuations around uh, i would say 10 kilometer scale so long answer <laughs> hopefully i answered the question Thanks, Neil. Another popular question here in the Q&A comes from Shihiro Kodoma. Thank you for your nice talk. Could you teach me, teach us how to uh, do the remapping from Icon Grid to Hillpix Grid um, and how it's treated in your workflow and how much it burdens compared with simulation itself? I guess that's a question to me. So how, how we do that, we do that internal to the model or that's in the in the coupler so it it um, happens entirely in memory so nothing goes via disk and we write the full hierarchy directly to the disk so the 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 coarsening and the creation of the interpolation to the hill pick script and the coarsening um happens in memory now i have to look what the second part of the question was um oh, it disappeared um uh, how much burden is compared um we do that distributed, so it, I mean, it's a burden on the memory, but if you have enough memory, it, uh, it disappears in the noise of the computations um, in, in the test setup, how we did it. Of course, it depends in the end how much you write out and how you structure that and how often, um, but if you configure it right, um, then it is close to no burden on the computations. Because I mean, in this um, we use this um, distribute uh, this structure of the ZAR files also when writing the data out that we we write in, in principle many many small files and small chunks, which also helps later to access the data that you actually only access the part of the data which you really need or smaller parts, <clears throat> and we use this structure of the data when writing. So, um, and this can be done um, with many processes or uh, distributed over many nodes. And it, it it's like an I/O server which is run on the on the on the side of the simulation, so it happens asynchronously. Okay. If the speakers are happy, we will keep going with the Q and A uh, a little longer. And if we run over time, then apologies if you have to to leave the the meeting. But uh, an important question from Eleftheria about how do these K-scale simulations compare with the coarser simulations in terms of their biases and drifts. And I guess an opportunity to return again to uh, your your slide two, um, Daniel, around this upscale feedback. So what, what evidence do you have around that? Well, I mean, these models are new, so we haven't, so currently um, a little bit, we learned a lot when building those models and that's what we try to convey a little bit. And so we are still in the learning process and we have inherited parts of the model physics from models we ran already for decades. And um, we discovered errors in, in these parts, which always have been there in all our previous generations of models. So, um, and because we are still building the model and improving the physics and fixing errors, we did not tune yet. So, I mean, if we run a simulation now for longer time scales, it will definitely drift because, I mean, we we make sure that the top of the atmosphere day flux are, are kind of okay, but we don't spend too much energy to make it perfect because our simulations will not be very long yet. So that's something we have to <clears throat> address very soon. Um, to to get stable long term integration. So this long term we are not there yet. So but we we are working towards longer simulations, and then we need to address uh, these issues. And that goes goes along with biases. So currently we we do a simulations and we we try to understand what we see and try to learn from that and try to understand the model. Um, and then. In, try to improve it based on that, but we don't try to address systematic biases yet. So, and, and the question is then still also at this stage, the development, is a bias an implementation problem we did, or is it a systematic bias of this new generation of, of models? So is it something which 
all the other storm resolving models would share. So it, it's it's relatively early days. So, but it's quite exciting, and we're also curious to know about the bias. <laughs> But also, I mean, I, I want to add to that and say, for instance, in precipitation, I mean, and also many papers have already shown that in regional scale, in, in la, uh, spatial uh, scale in regional domains, that light precipitation, for instance, is already resolved going to storm resolving models and like uh, uh, no using convective parametrization. So I think there are many advantages like uh, going for this kind of new generation of simulations. We have a question from Matthew regarding the Aleutian atmosphere momentum coupling. Wouldn't having a wave model affect this quite a lot, especially at high resolution, strong wind speeds? Yeah, that's an excellent question, actually. I believe so. Um, and in fact, so we are currently in a proposal writing stage, at the end stage of that, actually, where we uh, suggesting to do exactly this. So the German Weather Service already developed um, in, uh, in a surface wave model that is working on the icon uh, numerics with the icon numerics on the icon grid and now we plan now the next steps to implement this into um, into our coupled framework and to couple it to the ocean and to use for instance Stokes drift for Langmuir parameterizations but also modify surface roughness modify upper ocean transports and hopefully doing this energetically consistent and uh, yeah, so that's we have yeah we have large hopes in in, in this kind of of um, development actually. And maybe just to close out on the theme of uh, ocean atmosphere coupling, um, Masaki Sato asks um, about do you have experience of looking at MCSs in the coupled experiments, and uh, how do you find that those are are impacted by the mesoscale coupling? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, it's not, uh, uh, I wouldn't say an impact because we didn't compare. What we did is to analyze the mesoscale convex system in the, scapular, in the coupling uh, simulations with a master's student from, from uh, France, uh, Enora, and then also with the help of the people from Toulouse for track this MCS in these couple simulations. And we found that when I was talking about the rain belt, we found that in our simulations, 40% of the precipitation in the rain belt comes from MCSs indeed. So MCSs are there, and now we want to understand exactly what is their role for the tropical rain belt. And also we want to translate this question for the land. So what is the, 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 the I mean, the, the influence of mesoscale convective system when we talk about precipitation over, over the land? Well, with that, we would like to thank our speakers for today, Daniel, Nils, and Hans, again, for these excellent presentations and for answering um, all the questions. Many thanks to all of you online for your attendance and participation today um, in the chat and for posing very interesting questions. And if you have any feedback on today's event, it's very welcome. So we have uh, some email addresses, hopefully, on the screen here uh, for Kelly, myself, and also Rosie, who you may remember from uh, the first session, who uh, is currently away on uh, maternity. Um, and also very happy to hear from anybody who wishes to volunteer a seminar on a related topic for future events. You'll see from the web link uh, that, that we are lining up seminars right through uh, through next year already. So please get in touch directly if you want to uh, offer a talk to this series and hoping that the series is offering um, some value for, for you and, and to link up our, our investigations in, in this space around the challenges and, and research progress in uh, kilometer scale, global and large domain simulations. Next time, we're looking forward to uh, presentations from Dr. Daisuke Takasuka from the University of Tokyo in Japan on multi-year climate simulations with 3.5 kilometer mesh Nikon model. Um, advertisement and registration will be distributed shortly for that event. We hope to hold this on Tuesday, January 16th of 2024, and we will confirm a time for this event shortly. And just before we round off, uh, if we didn't manage to get to your question in the Q&A, um, 
please feel free to forward those directly to Daniel, Niels and Hans uh, and keep the dialogue going, please. Um, we'll also keep all the registered participants informed of when the recording goes live uh, on the web page. And please feel free to cascade that and share this uh, with colleagues around your networks and your organizations uh, and encourage them to keep uh, coming back and register for future events too. So with that, that wraps up uh, our session for today. A huge thank you again to uh, Daniel, Niels and Hans. And thank you to Kelly for uh, co-convening the session with us. Um, thank you as well to Nico and all of the Secretariat at WCRP for all their support in making these events happen. And with that, thank you again for everyone for attending and we look forward to seeing you next time. All the best and enjoy the rest of your days.